You know, even in the midst of recent events, it's important we remember every day the impact our work makes. And in the next two days, we'll hear more about the four women whose stories embody the pillars of our work. We'll hear about Annie, who was helped by our community programs where our 120 affiliates have raised and invested more than a billion three hundred million dollars. We'll hear more about Catherine, who benefited from our research initiatives, where we're the largest funder and innovator of breast cancer research outside of the federal government. And we'll learn more about Maha, who's an icon of our global movement, where we're fighting in places like Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, helping women who otherwise wouldn't get help. And we'll hear about Vanessa, whose treatment would not have been possible without our advocacy efforts, where last year we preserved nearly $100 million for screening and treatment programs across 40 states. You did that. <laughs> Taken together, our work has helped increase the five-year survival rate for breast cancer, for early breast cancer when caught early, to 98% from 74% when we started this organization 30 years ago. That's remarkable. It's a record to be proud of. But we have much, much more to do, as Bridget so eloquently told us. We've always worked hard to be the best organization while being mindful that we won't be a perfect organization. And in the past five weeks, I know that I and the leadership have fallen short of your expectations. The recent controversy over our community grants and the way it was handled hurt a lot of people, hurt the people we serve, the people we care so much about, and also many of your friends and families as it's touched mine. When my own mother, 91, Susie's mother, called me in tears after watching the evening news wondering why people were saying such bad things about her. You were confronted with stories, comments, and questions that you didn't ask for either and didn't deserve. We let you down. And for that, I'm profoundly sorry. No explanation will ever fully allay the anger, hurt, and disappointment. But I can only tell you that our motivations were and our intentions were as they've always been, centered on trying to help women. But we didn't ask the right questions. We didn't assess it properly. And in the ensuing days, we were too slow and clumsy and indecisive in our response, didn't rely enough on our local affiliates to help us, which only made all of our work more difficult. What I can tell you is that we, the leadership, Liz Thompson and I, recognize those missteps and talk about it every minute of every day. We're listening, we're learning, and we're taking action. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. And we're going to be more powerful. We're going to be more effective. And we're going to be a better and closer organization than ever before. Because ultimately, this organization doesn't care about your ideology, your politics. We only care if you're for the cure, for the cure. So on the national level, we're taking concrete steps to try and fix what's been damaged. And I was so glad so many of you participated in yesterday's meeting and the meetings that will take place this afternoon and Saturday and over the next several months. As we've announced this week, we're taking several steps to increase collaboration between our affiliates and the leadership. These steps represent the beginning, not the end. And each action we're taking is designed to ensure that what happened never happens again. I recognize that we won't get through this today or this weekend, or maybe even this year. There's a lot of tough work and candid conversations coming. But to get through this, I can tell you for sure, there's one thing about age. You learn a few things along the way. First. We've got to respect each other. 
we're going to need to respect each other in our dialogue, in our thoughts, and our actions, especially when we don't agree. And those of us in leadership roles within this organization and within our affiliate organizations need to do a better job of respecting and listening to the opinions of those working at every level, the community level, the national level, the global level. We all need to respect each other a lot. And second, focus. Focus, focus, focus. As Yogi Berra said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> Our main thing is helping women finding a cure and finding a cure. Isn't that our main thing? We need to focus like a laser on that mission and nothing else. This is what the public wants from us. This is what we have promised. And this is what we must deliver. They don't want less Susan G. Komen. They want more Susan G. Komen. Our demands are growing and our resources are shrinking. Government resources are shrinking. So we all have to tighten our belts and make sure every dollar we spend and every decision we make is supporting our core mission. The third, the third principle, optimism. Can we have some optimism? <laughs> Helen Keller, who once said uh, that w when she was asked uh, if she minded being blind, and she said, no, the worst thing is having sight and having no vision. Another thing she said was about optimism, the faith that leads to achievement. We must never lose our faith that we're going to eradicate breast cancer. We can't. We have to be optimistic. If we have these three things and there is no barrier, we can't break through together. Because if this battle is us against breast cancer, we will be victorious. If this battle is us against each other, we won't be. We just won't be. So in the past month, I've had a lot of conversations with many of you. I've heard the anger, I've heard the frustration, and the disappointment. And I will carry those conversations with me forever. They're a reminder of how we need to improve. But in the past year, I've had some other pretty amazing conversations. Conversations that remind me of how we've succeeded and why we need to keep pushing forward. I remember meeting a young survivor in the last several months in New York City. She had no insurance and nowhere to turn. She was helped to get treatment and guided into a really good program. And when I met her, we talked about the reconstruction options available to her. Options? She had choices about her own reconstruction. And when the process was completed, there would hardly be any physical sign that she ever had breast cancer. That's what Susan G. Komen has done. And I couldn't help but compare that to the first time I was confronted with breast cancer as a, I don't know, an eight or nine year old child with my great aunt Rose who after her battle in the 1950s <clears throat> was forced to live with a bluish purple scar on her concave chest after receiving a radical mastectomy. That's all they did in those days. And her only reconstruction consisted of a very tight corset that provided as much pain as support. And then I remember meeting a survivor in Washington who after defeating breast cancer 15 years ago received the heartbreaking news that she could never have children. And I remembered shortly after my own battle with it, getting that news myself, and realizing that Eric um, would be an only child. Well, what a great son. 